Thanks, Avi, for having me. Um, and thanks to the IS for hosting me. I'm honored to be here. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I want to tell you about this uh, paper, which is uh, joint with Michael Walter. Um, and it has a lot of invariant theory and quantum stuff, but hopefully people will uh, slow me down. I really don't want to uh, lose people. Uh, so let me just get started. Um, so the outline is I'm going to talk about some uh, um, some relationships between uh, group actions, invariant polynomials, and uh, norm minimization. And I'm going to talk about how it's related to um, these kind of estimation problems and in quantum information theory. And then I'll talk about a little bit about this kind of famous problem. Um, but don't get too excited. I don't know how to solve this problem, but it just seems seems related. And uh, I'll give a little little bit about proofs and then some open stuff. Um, and I should say that there's some very closely related work by uh, Batero, Cristiano, and um, Rana, um, <clears throat> which actually was at the same time as ours and inspired a lot of the quantum interpretations here. By the way, Cor, in the, in the institute, the speaker can remove the mask. If it's up to you. Okay, maybe I still keep it, audience, but it's just don't want to spray everyone. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. I feel like I have a good range here. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, let's talk about uh, group actions and invariance and norms. So um, <clears throat> here's a just a vague motivational slide. So you could have a, a group, um, you know, like the ones you learned about in algebra, acting on some object. Maybe uh, a group can act on a graph by permitting the vertices. Um, and think of G as being like the symmetries of the class of objects. And a lot of times we want to know things like, given two objects, are they equivalent under the group action? Um, so graph isomorphism is the same famous problem with this. Famous example. Uh, another way of saying this is do they have the same group orbit? The, the orbit under group is everything that you can reach um, by acting on a, a particular point. And <clears throat> invariants are some, well, they don't have to be simple, but they're useful if they're simple, quantities that are unchanged under the group action. So for example, uh, <clears throat> if you have two graphs that are isomorphic, they'll have the same degree count, you know, uh, numbers of vertices of each degree. And so this is, invariance can be a simple way to certify that uh, two objects are not equivalent. So uh, the setting we're going to be talking about here doesn't have anything to do with graph isomorphism. It has to do with group actions on vector spaces by some continuous groups. And uh, what that means, a group action, is uh, a homomorphism from the group into uh, the invertible matrices. So uh, GLM means the uh, invertible complex M by M matrices. And out of laziness, we're going to write that this uh, image of this homomorphism acting on a particular vector is just going to be written as G dot V. So G dot V is how we're going to denote this group action. So you just have a, a subgroup of all invertible matrices acting on vectors by matrix vector product. Sure, yeah, you could think about just the image of, uh, yeah, exactly. I suppose in this part, there's really too many moving parts that the image of this homomorphism is just a subgroup of the invertible matrices, and you can think of it that way. So just a couple of examples. This is the, for whatever reason, called the defining action. It's the simplest one where group is already GLN, the vector space is already CN, and you just act by matrix multiplication. Um, there's a, another interesting one, the conjugation action, where the group is uh, the invertible matrices, but the vector space is the n by n matrices, and you can act on a matrix by conjugating. 
um, a simple one um, where you, your group is actually abelian, you can look at this um, group of, I didn't say, but complex numbers where their product is one um, acting on a two dimensional vector space by just scaling the coordinates. Um, what was the group action in this? Uh... The group action is so x, y are group element. This is a group element. It acts on a 2D vector by just scaling. No, 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 no. In G, when you write the, the tuples on the line x, y equal to one, uh -huh. what's the action? Oh, what's the, what's the product? The group product. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> these are just two complex numbers. Multiplication. Yeah, yeah, but it, it means the group product is you take x1, y1 times x2, y2. It's yeah, yeah. x1, x2, y. No, no, not the action. You said what the group is, but it's not completely specified when you don't say what the group product is. So you just multiply first coordinate with first coordinate, second coordinate with second coordinate. It's really a one dimensional group, right? If the product is one. Okay. Yeah. If the product one is just X and X. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And do it, uh, yeah. And it's just uh, the, the complex numbers under multiplication. That's right. Yeah. yeah, you could also think of it as exactly the just uh, a single number, X and, and uh, C except zero, and X dot AB equals just. X A B over X. Right. And okay, so the groups that we're going to talk about today, I think I'm just going to talk about ever going to talk about GLN, SLN, or products thereof. Um, but there is like a formal definition of what um, what groups this theory will work for. They're called uh, reductive groups. Also diagonal groups, like a billion groups also. Right, I guess, but you could think of them as like products of GL1 oh, or something like that. Yeah, yeah products of GL1. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So like, yeah, another good example is, uh, you know, for concreteness, just add it to the list, like groups of uh, diagonal matrices, which is really just like products of, of these uh, complex numbers. Um, so as I was mentioning before, what, what you want to know when you think about these problems is, um, well, are points equivalent under these orbits? And it turns out not to be so easy to think about whether uh, these vectors have the same orbit but rather the orbit closure. The reason is that the groups are we're talking about are not uh, compact, so that things can kind of, uh, their closures can intersect even if they don't intersect. Um, so here's the particular uh, example I was talking about on the page before, where we have, you, you could say we have X acting by X times A and uh, B over X. So, these orbits, I've drawn, well, only the real, I've kind of taken everything back into R, but this is what the orbit would look like, right? Uh, the Y coordinate, um, this could turn into X over two and two over X. This could turn into two X and two over X. So these are what the orbits look like. And in this case, you see the, neither the orbits nor orbit closures uh, intersect. But if the product is different, if the product. Yeah, I just mean this very specific v, example. Yeah, uh, if. For v, v and W. So yeah, what Avi's pointing out is that the product of the coordinates is going to maintain, or is going to stay invariant under this group action. Sorry, maybe I may say, what do you mean by orbit closures? Orbit closure uh, just means, so <laughs> first of all, the orbit of a point this is just, you know, every uh, everything you can reach, right? And this is just the uh, 
the orbit closure is just literally the the uh, closure under the like Euclidean norm under this on this complex vector space. Yeah. Do not know the limit points. Good. Thanks. Okay, and as I mentioned, we we like it when there's simple ways to certify that things are not equivalent. So that's where invariant polynomials come in. Um, <clears throat> so if we have a group acting on this complex vector space, an invariant polynomial is going to be one that is unchanged by the group action. So what this means is that for every uh, vector in CM and every group element G, we have this identity. So moving around the point doesn't change the value of the polynomial. Um, and we're only going to talk about homogeneous ones, and we're usually going to fix the degree. This denotes the set of uh, homogeneous invariant polynomials of degree k. When you, when you talk only about homogeneous, does this mean that you, you can add another scaling factor to your group? But like the, the homogeneous gives you some invariant under certain scaling. So uh, is it something, and if, if not, then is it something that you need or is it? Uh, it's not particularly important. I mean, because. Uh, so the, the reduction for the homogeneous is just because these are the building blocks. Yeah, so actually all the, all the group actions that we're going to consider um, are even going to fix each of these sets of polynomials. So, and in fact, if you if you wanted to consider other polynomials, uh, you can exactly the degree the degree yeah. of them will be fixed, right? So it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's without loss of generality. Um, yeah. So here's an example of uh, an invariant polynomial. For the scaling action we were talking about, um, the polynomial where you just take the product and raise it to the k will be a invariant of degree 2k. Um, and that's all of them um, up to you know rescaling. The so all powers of a b. Yes. Okay, and there's a famous theorem um, that <clears throat> For reductive groups, uh, orbit closures are disjoint if and only if there is a uh, homogeneous gene variant polynomial which disagrees on the two vectors. Uh, one direction of this is easy to see, which is that if, uh, if they're the same, then every polynomial must agree on the two points because <laughs> These polynomials would be continuous, and there's a point in the intersection they have to agree on that point, which means they have to agree on the original uh, vectors. So, and the the non-trivial direction is the is the other way, which is that uh, there, even if, if they are disjoint, then there is a polynomial that separates them. Can can you say in a word what reductive is? Um, no, 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 it's not, it's not that bad. It, it's, there is a, there's a couple of definitions. The definition that's, I think is nicest is that if you, uh, uh, look at the group actions by such groups, um, they always decompose into a sum of irreducible ones, which means that you can write, if you, if you look at a group action, um, you can always write it as a direct sum of uh, other group actions, which themselves cannot be written as a direct sum of any further ones. Isn't that any cool? Sorry? I thought any, any representation can be- Any, any finite group or compact ah, group okay. has that property. I see, I see. Yeah, it's okay. like- um, Into a finite number of them or into- an... uh, Well, yeah, finite dimensional ones can be decompose into a finite number of such pieces. Okay. Um, so, thank you. Um, right, another way to think of it is uh, if you do have a compact group and you sort of look at its uh, 
it's not important that this, this be understood super precisely, but if you, you do have a compact group and you look at its, uh, its Lie algebra, what it will look like is a real vector space. What you can do is sort of add i times it, and then that's a new Lie algebra. So you have like the original Lie algebra k plus i times k. That will be the Lie algebra of something, and that will be a reductive group. So that's called like complexification. So you get these as by complexifying uh, yeah, compact groups. So for example, one of the ones that we're going to talk about a lot is uh, U in the unitary matrices. So the complex, complex, complexification of this is GLM. Uh, C. So I just I, I'll go ahead and say so the the Lie algebra of this is going to be uh, into the I self joint. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so the Lie algebra, so group. Algebra. This is going to be the Hermitian. Yeah, I times Hermitian, and this will be everything. So that's Hermitian plus I times Hermitian, which is everything. So all. Okay, and uh, so a corollary of this. Uh, I should say just something about the theorem. I mean, uh, it's it's sort of amazing. We don't get, uh, I mean, this kind of thing that in mathematics is great. You have one geometric picture and one algebraic picture, and they are the same. I mean, there is an equivalence between uh, you know, natural geometric problem about these orbits, you know, which can be really complex in space. And this algebraic description that just uh, uh, you know, these polynomials uh, and uh, they uh, you know they, they, this is an equivalent uh, criterion for whether they you know the orbits are the orbit closures are disjointed. It's extremely powerful. It's not so hard to prove, but it's extremely powerful. Yeah, it's kind of a, a NP intersect co NP. Yeah. situation where you, where you get a certificate um, that you kind of don't expect. Um, so a corollary is if you just set one of these to be zero, so say set W to be zero, um, well, in that case, every you know homogeneous polynomials just vanish on zero. So you can look at uh, whether zero, the orbit closure of zero, which is just zero, intersects the orbit closure you're interested in. Um, <clears throat> so the question is, you know, can you drive this point to zero or not? Um, and the corollary is that this is the case, uh, or it's the case that you cannot drive it to zero if and only if there's some uh, homogeneous polynomial that doesn't vanish on, on the vector. So this picture is trying to indicate that the orbit is away from zero if there's some uh, invariant polynomial which is not vanish on. And this is just the math mathy uh, way of saying that. Okay, and this sort of corollary is what we're uh, the first part of this talk is going to be concerned with. Um, so the corollary says that the orbit closures away from zero, if only if there's a polynomial that doesn't vanish on the point. Um, but what Michael I got interested in is, uh, you know, how can we sort of make this quantitative? What's the distance of the orbit closure to zero? It's this uh, infimum here. And this norm is just the Euclidean norm. Um, and on the other hand, uh, you know, how large are these invariants actually? Um, on the point. Yeah, how, how, what's their typical evaluation on the point? Um, so what is your probability measure that you put on those uh, polynomials? Yes, that's a great question. I will explain it. I'm being very vague on this slide so far. Um, for now, just, uh, so these polynomials, um, 
they are a vector space. And just think it's it's a Gaussian on that vector space. So, um, okay, um, here's an example. In the the uh, for for an abelian group. So one of the cases that we like a lot is uh, the group where you have these thing called STN. So what is STN? Um, this is matrices. Diagonal matrices such that the product of all of them is one. And we're going to have a pair of such groups, and they can act on complex matrices by pre and post multiplication. Um, it turns out that um, the, the again the the group itself yes is just like uh, pointwise multiplication of the yeah 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 so. Yeah, so either however you want to think, matrix multiplication of these matrices, or like yeah, no, but but, uh, but uh, like each factor, yes. each one of the two, you have two matrices, right? Yeah. So each one of the two uh, is multiplied by the corresponding one, like first one with first one and second one with second one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So like x one y x two y two is just. Well, this example is just the, the group action on itself. Yeah, no, I think Alon was asking, we have a, a pair of STs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I see, I see, I see. All right. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's the, in the pair. Right, exactly. Uh, the multiplication is just like independently in any state. So if you, if you think of the matrix A, the group, one side of the left side is just scaling the rows by constant. Yeah. And the other one scaling is the col the columns by constant. Yeah. Yeah. Now it, for a moment it, uh, it bothered me that because the y is not inverse, then then when you do when you apply, it's not clear why it, it doesn't matter. Okay, you it's can because, the inverse if you be, want. because they are uh, from your because they are from your, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> yeah. So here's the action. Um, so. What are some <clears throat> invariants for this action? Well, the uh, the matching monomials, and what the matching monomials are is uh, over here. Just you take uh, you have your matrix A. You take, for example, a permutation, and uh, you multiply the corresponding entries. So we could have, for instance, uh, A1, A12, A33. This is a matching monomial. So everything that shows up in the permanent, right? Those are going to be invariant under this group action because <clears throat> if you act on this thing by x, y, uh, if you act on the matrix, you will just get the product of all the x's and the product of all the y's. So for this particular degree n, if you sum up all the evaluations of all these matching monomials, that will be equal to the permanent of the matrix you get by taking the modulus squared of the original matrix. So basically, you know, we will sum over permutations of the product. And because we're taking the modulus squared of each of these, going to be the permanent of the matrix you get by just squaring 
technology elsewhere. And it's a neat fact that, um, which is, is comes from this corollary that I mentioned that uh, actually <clears throat> zero is in the orbit closure, if and only if, I'm oh, sorry, this is a typo. If and only if the support of this matrix, which just means the zero non-zero pattern viewed as a bipartite graph, contains a perfect matching. Okay, again, let's see. The support is like, uh, <clears throat> if you have your matrix, um, you can think of the support, like for example, maybe a matrix looks like this. The, uh, the, graph, the graph that it represents? Yes, yeah, yeah the bipartite yeah. graph it represents. So the question, our, our question um, is, what's the relationship between the distance uh, from the orbit closure to zero versus the permanent, which is the sort of evaluates, evaluations of all these uh, uh, polynomials. Yeah, so, so that's, that's all I want to say is that, that this is sort of a kind of a motivating question. Okay, so here's our main result. Okay, so uh, for any vector um, in the, the representation and the action, if you look at uh, the limit as the degree goes to infinity, of this magnitude of a random polynomial, magnitude squared of a random polynomial, and then you lower to the one over k, um, this limit will be exactly equal to the distance between the from the orbit closure to zero. Uh, and so I should now kind of explain what uh, all this means. So for uh, the distribution that uh, P is selected from, it is a particular Gaussian distribution on this space of invariance. And it's, it's uh, if you wanted to find a Gaussian, you need to find what um, uh, inner product is there or like what, what basis to use. So I'll, I'll explain that on the next slide. And then over here, uh, for all the examples that we're gonna look at today, this is just gonna be the Euclidean norm, um, if you're looking at more general groups, it should be a norm that's invariant under this uh, sort of some compact subgroup here, but it's not gonna be important uh, today. Oh, let's see. And uh, there's just something I should mention that really technically we need to write limb soup here because there's some K where there's no invariance. Like in that uh, scaling example, they all had even degree. Uh, but that's the only problem. You can always just assume that something divides k, and then you'll get a limit. Is there any monotonicity? So is there anything that you can say that as k gets large, the, this uh, left-hand side becomes more? Uh... Yeah, there's a, there's a super multiplicativity that you can say. Uh, Every... Every invariant polynomial, when you square it, is an invariant one. polynomial of twice as big. And you may add more invariant polynomials. So that's, uh, that's right. That's, that's right. right. Uh, more monotonicity. That's why you get, that's why this happens, like why you get a limit uh, when you restrict a, a group, subgroup. OK, any other questions about this, uh, this thing? All right, I'll, now I'm going to kind of tell you hopefully, or what I think it means and what, what I, how I interpret each of these uh, sides. So um, first of all, this, this right-hand side, this distance, um, this is something that, uh, that I care about a lot, uh, that I've worked on a bunch of stuff, obviously also worked on a bunch of stuff with it. Uh, for whatever reason, it's called the capacity of the vector V. And we actually 
compute it to decide whether all the invariants vanish. Um, because uh, it turns out that in a lot of cases, it's, well, it's always computable to whatever precision you want, but in many cases, it's actually uh, efficiently computed. And here's a bunch of like words that indicate that it's it's useful. Um, one of the cool recent places it showed up is that there's some statistics problems where this quantity turns out to be the log likelihood. Um, and and one question is, um, you know, <clears throat> this quantity is for deciding whether the orbit closure intersects the zero point or not. And it's interesting to think about whether uh, you could come up with a similar quantity that was tractable to compute, which would tell you uh, kind of the distance between two different orbit closures. Like if you have g dot v and g dot w, these two orbit closures, uh, what, what function can you compute to decide whether those intersect or not? So that's the, the orbit closure intersection problem is, is still open except for abelian groups as of recently. Okay, um, now for the left-hand side, uh, I'll describe a couple of ways to think about it. Um, first of all, what's this uh, Bombieri norm that I mentioned? There, so I was saying that the polynomials are a vector space and we want to define an inner product on them so we can say what a Gaussian is. Uh, <clears throat> so the Bombieri norm is the inner product between polynomials uh, such that this identity holds. So what this means is that uh, if you think of uh, this as a polynomial, this polynomial is just the uh, linear form uh, it's just the polynomial uh, this linear form raised to the k Uh, so this is actually a because these uh, because these polynomials span the polynomials. Um, this is a legitimate way to define this norm. Another way to think about it is uh, if you have two polynomials p and q, this is the same as the Euclidean inner product. If you view P and Q as uh, tensors of, of uh, so say that, say that these are um, homogeneous polynomials of degree K. You can also view them as uh, elements of as K tensors. Um, so this, this Bombieri norm is the norm which makes these things the same thing, where this is just the Euclidean tensor, pro and, uh, tensor product between these two uh, tensors. The only difference between the Bombieri norm and the user norm or the Euclidean inner products is the slight change of the coefficients depending on the degrees of the monomial. I mean, it's just yeah, yeah. There's like just multinomial coefficients on, on the, uh, because in this picture, there's many things that are counted many times. Yeah, okay. you have many representations of the same monomial, so you just divide by this yeah. multinomial. Yeah, I could have just run basically. <laughs> you can think of your video. And the, the, should you restrict to all of those that are invariant under your know, group? So, well, the norm makes sense regardless. Uh, but when, but when, when you talk about the distribution. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, sorry, when we go back here. 
Yeah, when you when you talk about this expectation, you just restrict to the subspace of uh, invariant polynomials. So it's like um, it will be a Gaussian on that subspace, which is isotropic, which with respect to this uh, norm. So you should have the property that basically. Um, how should I say this? That doesn't it require that the, this norm uh, has nice behavior with respect to the to G? Um, if you want to define the, the Gaussian with this inner product only on the subspace of G invariant? Yeah, actually it it does uh, it does matter. Um, this and this, um, this norm is, uh, unitarily invariant. Um, so that's, that, that's why it, it behaves nicely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, what's an equivalent way to think of this, this expectation? Um, you can just as well think of a, an orthonormal basis with respect to this inner product of the invariance and just sum over um, evaluation squared of them. This is the same thing. Um, and this is all because this distribution is, is something isotropic. Uh, another way to think of it is as an average over, uh, over a subgroup. So in this particular cases we're gonna be considering here, we're just gonna think about uh, the subgroup being the unitaries. And you can get this, uh, uh, quantity by averaging this over the over the group. So u is the yeah u is the parameter that runs over the yeah yeah u, u is running over of u on v. That's right. And uh, and you can convince yourself of this by plugging in um, you know if v itself was fixed by the group then you would get the norm. Um, that's actually not very rigorous. Okay. Sorry? You, you raise the inner product to the power of k? Yes. The, this k is the degree of the invariance. Okay, so that's just another interpretation. Uh, and finally, um, another way to think of it is uh, as an orthogonal projection uh, to the invariant part of the kth tensor power. So what I mean by this is that if you have an action V, you can define the tensor power of V by uh, letting the uh, group element just act on each tensor factor individually. And there could be a subspace of this tensor power, which is fixed by the action of G. Um, and we can think about the orthogonal projection to that subspace. And then it turns out that this quantity is the same as the orthogonal projection um, of V tensor K to that subspace of things that is fixed. And this all, all this just follows from the, uh, you know, thinking of either it, the invariance as polynomials or as tensors. Um, and the fact that those are the same thing. So what is it our result end up saying about the matrix uh, matrix scaling being permanent? Um, well, we we don't get because it's it's a uh, our result is asymptotic in the degree, so it doesn't really say anything about the permanent only, but it does talk about uh, these uh, higher permanents. So I'll define these. So 
what you do is you sum over all integer matrices with uh, row and column sums t. So if you if you take t equals one, that's just the permutation matrices. And then this would just be the permanent. But if you get higher uh, t's, then you are summing over more and more matrices. And then you have to normalize this way uh, for whatever reason. But uh, these are some kind of fancy notions of the permanent. And what our uh, result ends up saying is that you can sort of express the limit of these permanents as this optimization problem, um, which I, I skipped the, the steps where you convert the minimum norm problem into this problem, um, but they're equivalent. Uh, so can you get again, what is, what is this one? This guy? The one is, is a- This is the all ones vector. All ones vector. Yeah. So this just says that the uh, column sums are all T and the, the row sums are all T. Yeah. This would be the invariant monobial. So, yeah, exactly. So, uh, right, I mean, the invariant monomials of degree n are exactly the permutation. That's what I showed you before. Now, what would be the invariant monomials of degree 2n? They'll be made, described by matrices whose row sums and column sums are two integer matrices. Yeah. Yeah, so these, these uh, things here will be invariant monomials. Um, In general, for any abelian action, you you know, the invariant ring will be generated by monomial. It's a, it's a simple fact. Yeah. So here the monomials are easily understood. Yeah, so um, actually this result is not very hard. You don't need our theorem for it. Um, it, uh, it comes already from some large deviations theory, which I'll get into if, if I can. But, uh, and, and there's there's another, little aside here is that there is already some really cool things about the relationship between the permanent and this capacity. And that's what uh, like Leonid Gervitz uh, has done. So he showed actually that just the regular old permanent is closely related to the this capacity quantity. And that's cool because the capacity is uh, um, Easy to compute, whereas the permanent is, is, is clearly not. So again, what was the definition of the capacity? Uh, this in this case, just take it as this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was a distance to the origin. Of the, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Originally, it's, a, it's the same. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the only difference is that you uh, right. Originally, we were talking about complex matrices. Um, if you just take the modulo squared of everything, you'll get this quantity where, where these are positive now and the, this is positive as well. Um, not so important. Oh. I mean, it's an amusing exercise for you that if A does not have a perfect matching, then this infinitum is zero. Right. And you can get it directly from the whole whole block from whole zero. Right, and I guess there's this famous uh, sort of sinkhorn algorithm um, is one way of deciding if there's a perfect matching is that you can iteratively, uh, you know, fix the row sums to one, fix the column sums to one, fix the row sums to one. Uh, and if there's a perfect matching, um, this will converge. This will converge if and only if there's a perfect matching. The reason that works is because it's alternating minimization on this uh, quantity. Um, anyway, this is a, uh, okay. Um, so that's the, the end of the, the first part about invariance and norms. Um, any questions before I talk about tomorrow? Awesome. Any questions from the Zoom audience by any chance? I don't know what the best way to. Okay. All right, so, so I want to do some um, more probabilistic interpretation of what is going on here. Um, 
So as I sort of mentioned before, if you have a, a group uh, acting on a vector space V um, for the, the, the groups we're talking about here, they decompose into uh, direct sums of irreducible uh, sub-representations, which can't be decomposed any further. So, so what I mean by uh, a direct sum is just So if, if you have uh, two representations, V and W, then the direct sum um, V plus W is, is just given by um, the following thing. So the action on a pair V, W is just G, V, V, dot, v, G dot, W. So when we say decompose, we mean write V as a direct sum of these uh, irreducible parts, which can't, can't be uh, decomposed any further. So here I've just written it this way to say that, well, you have a bunch of irreducible pieces, and then you might have some that are the same. So that's why this multiplicity is there. And, uh, well, lambda is right now, it's just, I haven't described where it lives, but just think of it as a set that indexes the, the different uh, irreducible representations. And you can assume that if, if V is finite dimensional, that the, the set is going to be finite. For those who like uh, Fourier transform, in the abelian case, if the group was abelian, then this decomposition will be just to the character. Of the group. Yeah, that's so right. where the, all the representations are one dimensional. Right. And so we can uh, come up with a family of orthogonal projections where you project um, down from V into all the stuff that looks like lambda, all the stuff in a particular part type. And actually, if uh, if the uh, norm of the vector is one, then this will give you a random variable, where if you define the probability of s being lambda as the norm squared of this projection, um, the reason is that all these projections sum up to one. Just like in Parseval. Yeah, that's right. It's Parseval's identity. Okay, and um, the, the quantum interpretation of this is that uh, a family of projections, you can think about it as a, a quantum measurement, which is just, uh, you start with like a quantum state, which is just a unit vector. I mean, it's really just semantical. Uh, start with a quantum state. If you have a family of projections, then uh, this kind of random variable defined from the projections, that's what a measurement is. Um, so uh, let me see if I talk about it here. Um, right, so the reason that we bother with this interpretation is if you have this quantum state, this measurement is something that you could do to it to get some information from it. Um, and then this slide, I'm just going to explain the same thing, except uh, if you have many copies. So if, if you think of this vector as a quantum state, if you take tensor powers of it, that corresponds to taking a bunch of copies of it. And you can just do the same thing as I did on the last slide, except you add a k, which indicates that uh, instead of being inside v, we're inside v tensor k. Um, okay. And the, the overall question of this part of the talk is, what's the uh, limiting behavior of this, this random variable as k goes to infinity? <clears throat> and how it ties into what we were talking about before is that 
uh, we get our result, uh, the main result from before just tells us what the probability of getting zero is for this random error. Basically, this is from the, uh, the interpretation of the, uh, the sum of all the invariant squared as the projection to the invariant part in B tensor K. That's exactly um, the probability that this random variable SK is going to be zero. So should I think about the, the random variable SK as if I do K experiments, K measurements of V? It's actually, it's, you can get it from one measurement of many copies of V. Um, so like imagine that you prepare something in a lab and you want to know something about it. So you, you prepare a bunch of copies of it. And before you do anything to them, you don't do anything to them. And then you do something to them all at once. Uh, it's not true that, uh, you know, that the projection the, you know, the set of uh, these orthogonal projections would be the tensor of all the, the, you know, the projection of one copy to the case tensor power. It will not be, there may be more. Yeah, like when we talked about the invariant polynomial, there may be more. So it's yeah. not like- Yeah, exactly. Experiment it's... once and uh, taking a tensor power. Yeah, it's, a, it, it's richer. It's not as richer. Yeah. Uh, okay. Can you explain again why uh, what we get when we look at the projection on the right polynomial, we get zero for the... Yeah, yeah, so, so well, for, for one thing, I haven't really said where lambda lives, but I just said, you know, uh, assume that at least lambda equals zero when you have the trivial representation. Yeah, you can talk about yeah. Abelian case, right? Yeah, sure. So, uh, Okay, so the, the, the first result we had was basically that this uh, limb soup, this k goes to infinity of this, uh, you know, random um, invariant is equal to the uh, informal norm of the group orbit. And the uh, the result I'm using here is that uh, you can write this as a projection um, the norm of the projection to the invariant part of the kth tensor power, uh, where this is. Uh, Previously, it was the same thing, only projections to the gene variant polynomials. So is the, is the trivial representation, the trivial representation somehow captures the... Yes, the trivial... Um... <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the, the uh, so in some sense, the invariant part of uh, invariant subspace of uh, V tensor K is like the exact same thing. It's, it's in, uh, it's in bijection with the uh, invariant polynomials. So actually there's a little bit of a, a lie here, but let me maybe not say bijection, uh, say it this way. And the, the way this works is that if you have a polynomial uh, P, just think of it as uh, up degree K. So this arrow would be, you know, view it as a tensor. 
as a K tensor. And if you view this polynomial as a K tensor, it will be a K tensor, which is fixed by the group action. So this projection here is the projection into the invariant subspace. And maybe, maybe what I didn't say is that the trivial representation is the same as, as the uh, invariant subspace. So everything that's uh, like, what the trivial representation means is it's just the representation that does nothing, sends everything to the identity. So <clears throat> the direct sum of all the trivial sub-representations is this invariant subspace. Um, does that make sense? All right. So I uh, wanted to do an abelian example to show that this is uh, familiar. Okay, so this is just the non-zero complex numbers as a group. And a representation of those is just uh, powers, right? You can just send a, a complex number to a power of it. And even including a negative power. Um, so the, the finite dimensional representations are just uh, Laurent polynomials because you can just kind of think of a direct sum of these things laid out in a row as a polynomial. So it's just, a, the Laurent polynomial is just a way of keeping track of, uh, of these powers. And how do you act on the polynomial? If, if you have a Laurent polynomial Q, you just act on it by acting on the, the variable. And this is acceptable because, again, of commutativity. Right. Otherwise, you'd have to put an inverse there. But so uh, this is what our Laurent polynomial looks like. So if the uh, L two norm of this the coefficients here is uh, is one, then the random variable S that I was talking about is just going to be uh, the random variable which takes the value i with probability uh, modulus square root of a i. Yeah, I want to be more concrete here. So the, the space of uh, Laurent polynomials um, of like maybe at most a certain degree the point is that you can uh, decompose this into a direct sum um, of just 1D representations as I was saying there uh, one dimensional sub representations and that's just going to be um, you know, the span of this particular monomial. So it's like the span of Z to the I. I go from minus Z to Z. Yeah, yeah. And when you, uh, and so this projection, let's call it, Pi i of q is just going to be basically just the i coefficient. And if you look at the, the norm squared, it will just be the i squared. So this random variable is just giving you, it's just an integer random variable. That's, that's all it is. Um, and the nice part is that if you uh, take tensor powers of Q to get this variable SK, it's actually just going to be the K fold sum of S. So it's the sum of the random variable K times. And so it's really easy to figure out what the limiting behavior of 
uh, this uh, this random variable be first of all, you know, it's it uh, if you normalize it, it goes to the mean of s, and there's all sorts of turnoff bounds and everything. You can completely understand it. Um, the reason that this is true is because if you uh, sort of taking tensor powers of these corresponds to taking powers of the polynomials, which then corresponds to uh, convolving the coefficients. And, and convolving uh, densities is how you sum random variables. That's where this comes from. Uh, so I, I sort of think of the, uh, the multivariate version as being like, uh, a non-commutative version of just taking independent sums of, of random variables. Well, non-commutative theory? I mean, you know, a higher dimensional is just a polynomial with more variables. Right? Oh yeah, higher dimensional is just, this, this whole thing works for multivariate polynomials too, and you get the same thing. <laughs> but for, uh, for G being non-commutative. Oh, for D non-commutative theory. Yeah. Yeah, it's not clear how you should, uh, like you can start with S. It's not clear what it means to take independent sums of S. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll skip over this, but just saying that what the first result, how you interpret the first result here is that um, it tells you the chance of, of getting, um, you know, a k-fold sum of random variables being equal to zero um, is just this equal to this minimization problem. But again, that's uh, also coming from the uh, existing turnoff bound stuff. Okay, here's a, another example which is not commutative anymore. Um, so. <clears throat> It's the group uh, SL2. So it turns out that the uh, irreducible representations of this group are given by um, spaces of bivariate homogeneous polynomials. So this is uh, the space of bivariate homogeneous polynomials of a particular uh, degree. And the way you act on these is just, so this is a two by two matrix. You just act by the variable on the, on the variables by the inverse. And um, so I think there's a typo, this should say lambda here, but uh, and there's a, a Representations of, of SL2 are closely tied to, uh, to quantum mechanics because. Wait, so, yeah, so what is lambda in this case? Lambda is D? Yeah, lambda is, is D. There shouldn't okay. be any, any D. Um, yeah, so it turns out for some reason uh, in nature that these uh, representations. Um, correspond to quantum particles uh, with particular spins. So uh, for whatever reason, the spin is, is lambda over two. Um, and uh, the, the, the irreducible ones are particles of kind of definite, definite angular momentum but there are particles also that don't have definite angular momentum and those come from just general representations of, of SL2. And the reason for this morally, not precisely at all, is that uh, the action of this uh, subgroup SU2, which is the two by two uh, unitary matrices of determinant one, corresponds to uh, rotations in space. And what I think is neat is that if you take a particle in some state V and you take K copies of it, 
measuring the total angular momentum of this particle um, gives you exactly this random variable SK. Uh, what does total mean? Um, total means that like, yeah, you, you imagine you have like a bunch of particles in your lab. You just measure the angular momentum of the whole system. But there's only one particle here. Yeah, the, the, the K, all K copies, I mean. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know exactly if this is a, a, a sort of practical thing that people do, but. So in the, in the first, you know, the first appearance of total is just one, was just one particle. Two lines. Oh, I see, I see, I see. That's that that does uh that's just angular momentum of one part. Yeah, so so, so okay, so you're right. There's like an overloading. So um usually in uh in quantum mechanics, you can also measure the directional angular momentum. The total angular momentum is uh the like so you have these directional ones. Total angular momentum, which is usually called L, is just the Euclidean L squared. Yeah. So what I really should say here is the like the total total angular. Momentum. So you can think of the uh, this probability of SK being zero is the chance. Um, of getting angular momentum zero if you have a bunch of particles. So now you do mean like uh, in this total, total, you do mean that you measure each one separately, like, like all at once, but the angular momentum of each one separately. Yeah, so, so actually you, uh, you can express this as the, the angular momentum of each one separately. But I think this is sort of special to this particular case. So like you can, you can write the total angular momentum operator as, uh, so if you have more than one particle, it would basically be like L1 yeah. plus I tensor L2. Yeah. So you, you actually do measure all of them. And, and they commute, so that's the... Uh, measuring L for each one of them from you. Yes. And then you're taking all of them. Okay, so um, let's now talk about what, what where SK lives in general. Um, so uh, I want to talk about what the set is indexing these irreducible representations. Um, so I won't prove this or anything, but there's a, a way um, to index these representations by uh, partitions with k boxes and in rows. And all that means is that uh, there's a, there are uh, non-increasing integer vectors with total sum k. So now actually you can think of sk as being a random variable on the integers, and it makes sense to, to ask about uh, where sk over k converges. And this, this sort of normalization, um, it turns out to be the right one, but it's, it's inspired by, you know, in the Abelian case, you just had uh, sums. Okay. All right. 
Um, so here's an example. Uh, the action of uh, GLN on matrices by left multiplication. Um, SK is called the empirical Young diagram measurement. And what it's used for is to uh, estimate the spectrum of an unknown quantum state. So uh, I talked about pure quantum states earlier. That's just vectors in uh, complex vector spaces. A mixed quantum state is a uh, trace one PSD matrix. And one of the things you want to know is uh, what's its spectrum, because that tells you how close to being a pure state it is and things like that. Um, and again, we can uh, learn information about the state by taking measurements of a bunch of copies of it. Um, we can take as many measurements as we want, but the only way to sort of reproduce row is to take copies. And there's a, a nice result in quantum mechanics that you can uh, estimate the spectrum of a quantum state row using this random variable SK. And that's the best known way to do it, actually. Uh, I don't want to say too much about this, but um, there's also a way to estimate the state itself. <clears throat> Basically, once you draw this random variable SK, you can draw another uh, unitary random variable, U, such that when you conjugate by this U, you'll get some, some new sort of matrix random variable, and that will converge um, to the state itself. And uh, you independent of K? Um, you mean, is it independent of SK? Yeah, no, if of K, you take. Oh, no, you, you, you could have a K as well. Yeah. K, 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 that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't tell, yeah. explain how to, to, to do this or anything, but. Uh, yeah, so there's a the question is. Um, this is a specific this is Kyle Werner result, and this result here are for this specific group action where you act on matrices by left multiplication. But you could act, ask where uh, where these random variables converge for general representations as well. Um, and are there you know large deviations principles? So. Um, <clears throat> The abelian case, as we, we saw, is basically just, well, SK is, in that case, actually, SK and TK are the same. And SK is just the sum of a bunch of uh, independent random variables, so it's not very hard. Um, people talked about the non-abelian case where uh, your mixed state is equal to the identity in the past. Um, but uh, Nobody's talked about it when you have a sort of a general state. So the, uh, the question is, where do these converge? And well, our first guess would be that um, using the fact that sort of SK and hence TK is close to zero whenever this thing is already minimized. Um, this was the result about the chance that it, it shows up as zero being the uh, minimization of, of that quantity. You can guess that maybe TK goes to the gradient. Um, you know, at least it's, they have the right, uh, they live in the right spaces. Um, it's actually this quantity, uh, which we denote by mu, which is the uh, derivative of the log of the norm after this change of variables. Um, so for very various reasons, this is called the, uh, the geodesic gradient. Um, it's also called the, the moment map. So here's an example uh, from the 
the angular momentum example. So the moment map is actually going to be this a two by two matrix, which encodes these uh, angular momenta, uh, which I think is kind of neat. So what was H? Um, yeah, H is uh, so in this in the case uh, of uh, of uh, GLM, H is just going to be um, Well, you could take H to just be anything in the Lie algebra, so any general matrix. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So H is always G equal to the identity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but actually, it turns out that you uh, you only need to look at H for mission. The part that isn't just rotates the vector, so it kind of doesn't. It's, it's zero. Um, so you only need to look at H for mission. Um, Right. And that's why this matrix ends up being actually a Hermitian matrix. matrix. These are the these poly matrices. Um, they're two some two by two uh, Hermitian matrices. But you can easily read off the uh, the angular momentum from this uh, moment map, which is kind of cool. Um, so some other ones. Uh, when we had uh, GLN acting on matrices by left multiplication, the moment map turns out to be uh, AA transpose, which is the state row that we were trying to estimate. So that's a good sign. But in the previous one, yeah, mu was traceless. Right. Um, yeah, that's because uh, in this case, the group was uh, SL2 instead of uh, instead of GL2. So actually, in this case, um, depending on how you want to think about it, you could either just make mandate that H is going to be traceless here, or you could observe that uh, like when you when you try to act by other uh, Yeah, yeah. So, so it should be in the Lie algebra of the group that you're considering. So, so uh, just yeah. The the in order to get the uh, that's the S L. That's the S L. Uh, yeah, this is the S. Uh, the S L section. Sorry. Sorry. Um, this is the. So if you have S uh, U2 and S L2, so the Lie algebra, so this is the group algebra. So this will be uh, traceless matrices. And this will be I times traceless. All right. So this gradient will end up being a traceless Hermitian matrix. Yeah. Okay. Um, another example is that if you uh, have a tensor, a three tensor, for example, which you can think of as like a quantum state that's sort of entangled between three different parties. Uh, and your action is the tensor product action. So you act on each tensor factor individually. The moment map is going to be uh, the uh, one body reduced density matrix. So this is the state that, uh, so say you have Alice, Bob, and Carol. This is the state that Alice sees. This is the state that Bob sees. This is the state that uh, Carol sees. Um, and this is just a, Kind of a, another sanity check and a cool fact if you haven't seen it is that this random variable uh sk over k is going to fill out this polytope 
um, called the moment polytope. And it, it turns out that uh, this moment polytope is the same as the uh, set of um, spectra of moment maps as, uh, sorry, that's say V dot V. Um, <clears throat> basically all spectra of moment map images over this orbit closure, um, which is actually very surprising. This is like a, you have some funny uh, continuous set and you uh, take, take eigenvalues and then somehow at the end you get a, a polytope. Yeah, yeah. The center for gradient happens to be a convex polytope. Right. And uh, so, so another sanity check we can we can make is that uh, whatever limit we find for this S K over K, it should be consistent with something that's already known, which is this uh, Doistermatt Heckman theorem, which is that if you take a random unit vector and then compute S K over K, that converges in probability to the uh, spectrum of the moment map of a random unit vector. And this, this uh, measure is called the Doistermatt Heckman measure, and that's a picture of it there for, for some example. Um, okay, so here's our kind of result here. <clears throat> so I admit this one's not as satisfying because I didn't tell you what TK actually is, but the corollary um, I think is interesting, which is that <clears throat> this uh, random variable SK over K converges in probability to the, the spectrum of the moment map. So for, uh, for, the, for example, for the angular momentum example, uh, what you would get is, Just, just um, what, what do you mean? So SK over K is a random variable that gives you what? Like where, where does it get its values? It's integer uh, sequences. Yeah, right? that's right. So it's normalized, so it's rational sequence. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be rational sequences. And the spectrum, the spectrum is a vector of, the, of dimension N. Yes. So what do you mean by convergence to that in probability? You mean? The delta. Uh, at that, like this is a uh, a random variable which is deterministic in UV. Oh, it converts to the spectral measure. It converges the, the the probability distribution of SK over K converts it converts to the uh, co convert to the spectral distribution of mu V. Uh, no, actually, just like um, you know, like we have Rn here. And mu v is just some particular point in there. And what I'm saying is that the uh, SK will be more and more tightly concentrated around it. So it converges to something deterministic. But SK it gets its values in R, not in Rn. Uh, SK gets its values in Rn, actually. Oh, that was my question. Yeah, sorry. So, yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah, so it's. Oh. Um, yeah. Okay. Right, for, for, for GLN, SK is going to be a partition, which is like an integer sequence. Um, and then you normalize by K to get something in the market. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. Um, and we also get um, basically a formula for the probability that this um, random variable is a particular uh, thing. Um, and again, that's going to be in terms of some minimization problem. But uh, maybe I'll skip that a little bit so I can talk about the uh, Jacobian conjecture. Yeah. Um, so as I was saying, there's concentration about mu v, and you get a. <coughs> some non-trivial upper bound on 
the sample complexity of estimating UD, like the one body marginals or the angular momentum. And there's this uh, shadow tomography problem where in quantum, where you would, uh, you have some state and you want to know some things about the state, but you don't want to know the whole state. Um, so for example, maybe you would want to know mu v. Um, you can do it with better sample complexity than estimating the whole big state. Uh, where I don't actually know of anyone who uh, wants to estimate mu v in a, um, like I've never, quantum people aren't, aren't begging me to, to explain this to them, but uh, I still think it's interesting. Uh, questions about that part before I call on. Try to be quick. Okay, um, so here's a seemingly unrelated uh, problem um, called the Jacobian conjecture, which is just that if you have a, a polynomial function um, on Cn, actually it should be from Cn to Cn, with a constant non-zero Jacobian, then it has a polynomial inverse function. You want to define the Jacobian. Yeah. Uh, so the, the Jacobian um, if you have a function f c n c n, and this is a polynomial, so it makes sense to write down this matrix, which is uh, you know d f one d x one. of the polynomial. Yeah, the, the, the components. Right. Each is a polynomial. And then I'm defining the Jacobian to be the determinant of this, although I guess actually this matrix is usually called the Jacobian. But what I mean in the conjecture is that if this polynomial has a constant non-zero Jacobian determinant, then it has a, uh, then the map has a polynomial inverse. Um, and I don't know, I don't personally know very much about the Jacobian conjecture. I don't understand much about the motivations of it. I just know that people care about it. Well, it's a very natural yeah, it's, it's, uh, question it's, to ask if you have a polynomial map, whether it's inverse, yeah. it's polynomial. If the Jacobian tells you if the Jacobian is just non zero, maybe as a function of, uh, it tells you at least that uh, uh, locally it has. Yeah, locally it's inverse. Right. Yeah, so I guess it's like a local to global question. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> the way it relates to what we're I'm talking about today is that. It's implied by another conjecture, um, so uh, called the Mathieu conjecture, which I'll need some some notation uh, to define. So uh, we say that a function from the uh, unitaries to C, you can define this for more general groups, but today I'm just going to talk about the unitaries. Um, a function on the unitaries complex value function is k finite. If there are two vectors in some representation of, of GLM, uh, such that f of u is given by v inner product u dot w. So that's just a definition. That's what a k finite function is. Um, and the Mathieu conjecture says that if you have two k finite functions, such that the integral of uh, the first one raised to any power is zero. Then for k large enough, sort of the inner product of uh, the power of one with the other is always zero. 
So the first integral we have seen, and this inner product f of u, this expression we have seen before. Right. Um, yeah, so, uh, so maybe before going to this example, I will. Uh, talk about how we've we've seen it. So if you just plug in what the definition of k finite is, uh, <clears throat> you get this integral, which looks a lot like the, uh, the average that we saw. Because what we did is, uh, right, by computing this uh, expectation of random invariance, we actually computed this limit of this uh, average over the unitary group. The only difference between uh, the Mathieu conjecture and what we did is that, uh, you know, V is equal to W, but what the question is, is, uh, whether our proof can kind of help with, uh, V not equal to W. And, um, I have a feeling that this, uh, making this work for V not equal to W has something to do with the distance between the orbit closures of the points. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure uh, what exactly it should be. Um, so maybe I'll, uh, for the sake of time, I'll skip the uh, abelian um, Matua bed and we can go back if people are interested. But uh, here's some open stuff. <clears throat> So uh, one of the things that, that we want to do is figure out, um, right, right now we have these concentration results for this um, random variable SK, but it would be nice to turn it into a central limit theorem. So say, what's the probability that it's uh, you know, on the order of uh, one over root K away from, uh, away from something? So it'd be kind of nice. And as I pointed out, it would be nice to understand this uh, this limit because it seems like it could help with the, the two conjecture, and also uh, give some characterization of the distance between orbit closures in terms of this uh, quantity. Um, and another thing which I didn't talk too much about is uh, <clears throat> We gave some, some large deviation principles for the chance of this random variable t k being equal to something. Um, but we can't write those in terms of some uh, divergence. Um, in the abelian case, you can. Uh, that's what Sanop's theorem is. But uh, in the non-abelian case, we don't know how to do it. Um, so that's another thing that I'm interested in. Um, OK. That I'll uh, oh I uh, have the proof, but uh, maybe I should uh, um, Avi, what do you the easy uh, direction. show the easy direction? Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so the, the easy direction, I guess, is the, uh, the, the lower bound, uh, but I can, I would have to show that on the board.
So the easy direction is uh, y is this norm always bigger than this uh, projection. Yeah. Right, so this this part actually turns out to be pretty easy. So, so that for for any k, uh, yeah, actually for any k, for k, for, for any k. Um, so, so proof. So first, just uh, write this as. Um, So right, if I take the norm of a tensor vector, that's just the power of the norm. Um, okay, so that's there. And now, um, this is bigger than or equal to, uh, True for any projection. Sorry? This will be true for any projection. Yes, exactly. This is this will be true for any, any projection. Um, the important thing is that uh, that actually this G will just be absorbed by this because uh, yeah, it's, it's the G invariant part. So this is equal to. I yeah, so that's the proof. So it's actually completely trivial, the lower bound. Um, the hard part is showing that there is actually enough going on here uh, that, that this eventually, um, as k goes up, this will reach this part. Um, and that part. Uh, Basically, what you do is uh, you assume that you have a unit vector, and you assume that uh, that this quantity uh, is already minimized. So assume so this is the interesting case. At the moment map is zero at this point. Right. Yeah, that's that's the, the nice thing is that you know that the gradient of this must be zero. So is called and then we're going to try to uh, figure this out by looking at formulating it as this average uh, over the over you um, and the idea is to just um, basically approximate it um, so for for you approximately uh, the identity, 
you can write that for as e to the ih for h being small. And it turns out that if you do the Taylor expansion of this, uh, you will get something that looks like this. The reason being that the first order term is this gradient, this moment map here, and we already assumed that that was zero. Um, so what that shows is that this average sort of looks like, uh, you know, you have you have the unitary, and you have uh, the identity here. This function is kind of doing something like that. Um, and you show that far enough from the identity, this uh, quantity is just small. And then you uh, use the compactness of this group to, to finish the proof that the, the small part just can't contribute very much. And uh, this part, you can compute directly and it turns out to be large enough. Okay, that's it. All um, right, thanks a lot. Question? Yes. So in the last slide, can you look at the last slide? So the, there was no use of the partition to the irreducible components here, or there is an implicit one. No, because no, it said it resembles the free analytic proof of the uh, of the of the local central limit theorem. Yeah, central limit theorem. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the only the way the way it resembles that is because. Uh, uh, in some way, you can think of this as being um, this function on the group as being kind of the Fourier transform of the vector v. And uh, in the local central limit theorem, one of the proofs, the proof that I know is that you, um, <clears throat> you take your random variable, you take the Fourier transform, and that's some function on you know minus pi to pi. And then it, if you, you make sure the mean is zero, it turns out to have the same properties. So like <clears throat> I, I think of this as being like analogous to looking at the integral from minus pi to pi yeah, or over the circle. More questions, people on Zoom. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks.